Sure. Okay, microphone's working tonight. Not going to have three minutes of dead air this time. So there we go. That's good. And uh, yeah, let me pop the chat up here. Dwayne, welcome. See you already in the chat. Paul, welcome. Cheers. I don't know. Let me get, sorry, just one moment. Set up so I can read your comments while I do the chat and stuff. Um, first of all, thank you guys for joining me. I love, <laughs> shut up. There is sound. There has to be sound. That was last night. <laughs> Are you messing with me? <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for joining me. Uh, just wanted to say I appreciate all the feedback I've gotten in my groups. Um, you know, for my world building, it's been a lot of fun. I found my binder today, so that was sweet. Got it right here. I've shown you guys in previous videos um, some of that. So, yeah, it, it'll continue to work for you guys. And, and it's not going to condense me and make me look real skinny on here because this is YouTube. All right. So i got to find a good spot for this. Let me, I don't want to spill my water anywhere. So before I get into it, I do something I've been uh, meaning to talk about a little bit. Uh, I'm not going into a full-on review right now or anything, but I do want to point out uh, a module. Um, it is by DMG Info. So go over to DMG Info's website. Um, you can purchase this there. It's called Under the Tavern. It's a really good system neutral setting. Um, you know, if you play with miniatures, it actually has the pictures of the terrain. Um, you can see all the tutorials on his web on his YouTube uh, for that. And it's it's just really good. It's there's a lot of good descriptions in here that that are worth checking out. Um, you know, taking this and porting it into any of your campaigns is really, really easy. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out there. Um, so I've been looking at that a little bit more again lately because uh, I'd like to run that um, for an upcoming group sometime. Uh, maybe I'll do it on this channel. I don't know. Um, so today I had posted to my community uh, in Master the Game on Facebook. I wanted to put a little more thought into more of the everyday life when it comes to magic items and technology, things like farming, uh, things like um, just communities in general. And, you know, it, it, it turned into a little bit more of comedy, which is completely fine. Um, always fun to do those, but uh, we were joking about all sorts of things. But some, some of the stuff that I took away from it that I liked um, is I was thinking, in my setting, I have a desert. Uh, it's called the Serpent Sands. It's a magical desert, um, and it's because of something that happened a long time ago. Not the point. Point is, is that it's you know there's no water there. Um, but it would I think it'd be really cool to put a city there. Uh, maybe it's a magically protected city, and the way they get their food is from magical means uh what that could mean is maybe there's clerics or druids uh rangers that you know they use their magic to either grow crops or food or to just provide nourishment maybe through means of good berries or whatever uh to the the town um but also maybe they provide fresh water through again magical means um, for things like that. I, I think that's a, a cool thing to do. Uh, yes, magic water. <laughs> uh, it's not that they built the city in the desert. So it, it wasn't always a desert. It actually was a forest, um, a very, very overpopulated, very dense forest um, originally. So maybe it's, you know, enough of people found a way to survive without leaving the city. Um, and they became so efficient, it just makes sense that they just stayed in the city. Plus, now you have natural protection from invaders because now you have a huge desert around it. So I think it could be something for my setting. Um, you know, and one of the things that I'd like that I've been working on is my Anvil Ringers uh, faction. My Anvil Ringers faction is from this region. So, um, Putting some of this stuff in there, I think, would be really cool. Um, competing druids for irrigation. They're like utility districts. 
I see. I think that'd be cool. You have like different. You can have different factions in there that provide different things for the the, the city. Um, but yeah. Well, and and so the idea was that it was a it was the reason the forest went away. It pretty much went away very quickly. It wasn't overnight, but it was very quickly. Um, yeah. Deforestation left the land unable to sustain itself. An environmental activist game. Uh, it is sort of inspired by um, talks with people about Dark Sun, just a little bit, just that portion of my world. Um, I've never played Dark Sun. It, dude, Under the Tavern's really good, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> Off topic. So, anyways, um, but yeah, so I was thinking like stuff like that. I've already talked about travel uh, and how you know, magical means of travel should be rare in my setting. I don't want my setting to just be completely over the top. That's, I, I want portions, very small, rare portions to be, but I don't want it all to just be, oh my gosh, another crazy thing and another crazy thing. But like once every, I don't know, five, 10 cities, or maybe all the big cities have crazy stuff. Towns, not so much because they can't afford it or whatever cities in my setting which i don't have a lot of them um i want to do something like that um we were talking today about using monsters for farming as well so rather than just always using cows and goats and lambs and horses maybe you use stuff like a boule or boulette or um you use things like wargs um you know things like that for everyday use on farms that might be kind of interesting do they use camels or animals which can stride the sand you know i haven't i haven't plotted it all out so you know that's a great question um if they're traveling long distance they would definitely use camels you i mean you wouldn't really use horses probably um but yeah you'd probably use camels for sure or maybe there's even more exotic animals the idea of exotic animals is cool with me you know maybe you use some kind of uh thing like a giant centipede for for travel you know and being controlled by a druid you know and that's how they travel maybe druids are your guides through the, the desert <laughs> yes those monstrous farming goliaths so earlier today we were talking about different races having uh not necessarily roles, but they were more equipped for roles within society. Um, and we were joking about Goliaths taking up all the labor jobs and it, <laughs> and other races fighting for equal rights. <laughs> Three minutes in, just starting. Yeah, no, we did just start. So we're good. We're good. Um, but yeah, I, so I, I like in, in my, I'm going to pull up my map. Let's see if, uh, Let's see if I can show the area a little bit better. Um, it's not a good one because it's the one I originally did. But I have had things added to it. So this is an incomplete portion of it. Let's see. Is this the one I want to use? Uh, oh, well, I'll show it. Um, so it's right in there. That's that's the, the desert. Now... It, obviously, it's magical. It's it, geographically, it doesn't make sense. It's to the southwest of mountains. You know, normally you have deserts on the east side of mountains, so it's a magical desert. Um, and yeah, so anyways, the mountains are huge nearby. You know, so maybe you could even use some mountain type uh, creatures, things like that. And uh, yeah, oh yeah, the lumberjack Goliath. That's what it was. That was the big deal. <laughs> um, yes. So anyways, there's no need for lumberjack goliaths in the city. Um, you know, and, and I, I like tropes. I've told you guys that before. I think having, uh, you know, serpent races, having, you know, all sorts of things like that would be kind of cool. Now, the another thing I want in this city um, is and again, it's not necessarily about mundane items, but I want to have a subterranean level. So you have a lot of the city above ground to outsiders. That's all they know. But then I want multiple levels underground. Um, so I want some kind of a travel system for underneath. 
Um, I want it to be a large city, very large. Um, it doesn't concern itself too much with trade. And so it doesn't send people out much. However, maybe because they do have certain things that are considered valuable to other places, other um, settlements try to come there to get things. Um, but yeah, so that's what I, I think I kind of kind of like. Um, West Africa has a bit of desert, and that's right on the ocean. Okay, I, yeah, I didn't know that. Um, you know, I've, I'll, everything I've always read is you want to have a desert to the east of mountains because um, the way... Uh, weather patterns work when they hit mountains it usually drops all its rain and then on the other side it usually doesn't so um just what i heard oh cool cool thanks for uh using your notifications does that mean you have the bell ticked for me that's cool um depends on the jet stream's direction oh okay so if the sun rises in the west you're golden and if he has one sun yes i have one sun uh i i kind of want it to kind of mirror earth just because it's you know not mirror it but i want it to be similar to earth now one of the things i do want to also point out is this is not my whole world in fact um obviously up here would be like north pole type of thing i'm thinking like around here would be or maybe even a little bit further south would be the equator type of deal because uh, i want to leave myself room for growth uh my wife's campaign is running in my world but a much different portion and i want her to have the creative freedom to make it as big or small as she wants um so yeah border of beach to desert yeah so the border of of beach to desert is actually um more normal there's so let me see if i can find another map i have a city that's located coastal um uh, on that coastal region um that is where the anvil ringers started and you know the anvil ringers um is something i'm i really like it's i think it's one of the more creative factions in my world um not in this one i don't think nope i'm gonna find this map i love my maps <laughs> uh, i don't know where it's at too many things too many notes uh, that's not it. Here's a zoomed in portion of my world, but it's a small portion. Uh, it's got to be in this portion, this section. Um, but yeah, so I want subterranean sections to this city. I want it to have, um, you know, like, so above ground, I want everyone to, like, if they visit the town, be like, wow, this, there's not like a poor district. Like, everyone seems normal. Uh, everyone's really friendly and courteous and you know whatever but i want like the dark the dark seedy stuff to be underground uh, i actually think it would be cool to have um drow in charge of a district down there too uh, i think that would be kind of interesting um but yeah so i i think you would i would need some monsters that are used to tunnel to grow in fact i want the underground to be much bigger than above ground and uh have all sorts of tunnels to you know the under dark um keep it simple is usually the best way to go yeah i agree with that um you know this is uh for me i want this to be a very fantastic area um you know and i again i don't want every city to be fantastic i i'd like to keep things simple and sticking to the tropes um that's not it either. Hmm. I can't find my good maps. That's bumming me out. Bumming me right out. Oh, well. I guess it doesn't matter. I just went through like this whole thing and couldn't find it. Not going to worry about it. I'll find it later. Um, maybe it's in the front. Nope. It's not. Um, yes. Keep it simple. Uh, the Sahara Desert starts West Africa on the ocean and goes all across the north of the continent. It's a little bit massive. Curves of water under the desert city. That sound familiar. Yes, definitely. Um, but I do want, a, again, I, I want um, to add some spice, like some, some magical elements that make it possible to survive in the city above ground. Because, I mean... 
mushrooms from the underdark. Like that's not what I'm going for with this. Uh, I want like tropical oasis. I want fruit. I want it to be, you know, within the city. I want plants. Like I want, you know, huge, huge trees. Like I want crazy stuff like this. Um, that's what I want. Um, pure white. That would be fun. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I, that's what I'm thinking. I want stuff to be again, over the top for the city. Um, this isn't a city where I necessarily want my players to make a home base or anything like that, but I want them to go there and spend some time there and explore it and find out about it, what it is. Um, that's what I want out of it. And so again, the mundane stuff I think is important. I want farms, um, maybe in a certain portion of the city. I want a bunch of farms that are, um, you know, trying to, you know, maybe they're growing good berries. I think that would be cool because what is it? And and maybe I don't call it good berries, you know, because I want it to still be system neutral, but maybe it's, um, I don't know. I got, I have to think of something, some kind of name for it. I want to call it like a, some kind of fruit. Um, but it's it sustains people for a day you know you, you eat just a little bit of it and it'll it'll give you everything you need for at least a day um rooftop gardens oh actually that would be cool i didn't think of that topsoil import would be a lucrative business maybe that's what other settlements bring to them they bring dirt <laughs> for growing their their crops uh, on the rooftops that would be interesting um band of my day and at night everyone comes up for the caverns to work yeah see that could work too i i'm, I'm digging these ideas and and maybe i can you know take a little bit maybe it's certain portions of the city like that maybe not all of it or or maybe yeah maybe all of it is like that that's good i like that um Oh, God. See, I love doing these videos. I get more ideas from you guys than I come up with on my own. It's, it's amazing. You guys do my world building for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, so with that, I think that kind of covers the desert thing. I think there's a lot of different fun, cool things I could do there. Come up with ideas. Cool. Keep posting them. I, I love to hear them. Sunfruit, I think, could be cool names. Yes, As sun kind of makes sense just because sun, without sun, there is no life, right? I mean, that's not 100% true, but um, that's why we're here. Those are cool names. Yeah, I like, I kind of like the sun fruit one. But, and maybe it gets its name off, you know, because of the color or something. I don't know. Or maybe it's a different color in sunlight. Blood red juice. Yeah, it's, it's got to get its name from something like that. Heart fruit. Yeah, I like that. Heart fruit, blood red juice. Yep. No, that's cool. I like that. Um, the other thing I was thinking, so up in more like the North Pole-ish area or Antarctica type area in the South. So that's the other thing. I don't know with my South Pole region if I want that to be or if I want it to be volcanoes, extremely hot, unbearable. I've played with the idea of making it more of, excuse me. Um, I've, I've toyed with the idea of making it more like unbearably hot. Um, so most people wouldn't want to travel there kind of thing. But I kind of like the idea of having things hot, you know, like, like around the equator and then the poles are, are cold. Um, and, you know, and maybe even around the equator, Maybe that's where a ton of volcanoes are. It's like the ring of fire. Not to be taken, you know, not to be confused with uh, um, would WWAD's game within the ring of fire. But yeah, I think that might be cool to have something like that. Uh, the city is built inside a massive cavern all along the walls. Streets run up and down across and along the cavern walls. Maybe it's called sunfruit because it needs a lot of heat and sunlight to grow. So it thrives in deserts and surfaces. You know what? What if it has both names? Why couldn't it be called a sunfruit? And some people call it a heart fruit. Same thing. You know, we cut it open and it bleeds juice, blood red juice. Um, maybe people are known in theater. Maybe bards are known to 
uh, to use it to to play up uh, bleeding when they're not actually bleeding on stage. Maybe uh, gladiators or or you know performers just in general use it to st to simulate blood when they're they're acting or trying to get a reaction out of a crowd. That might be interesting. Um, the surface is nearly unbearable. Make it part of Iceland or Yellowstone. A sun heart fruit. Yeah, I think I could. I think I like that. That would cause a war. Heart fruit versus sun fruit. Which side are you on? <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I that is a really cool idea. Uh, I'm definitely going to use that. Love it. That is so good. That I never would have came up with that without doing this. So I love that. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of traveling on like a giant centipede or a giant millipede, um, you know, across the desert. And, you know, maybe there's specific druids or rangers who control these things. Wild, maybe they're these things are basically like purple worms on above ground and just devour people. Um, so you wouldn't, you would need some defenses though on the exterior of the city to keep these things out. Um, you know, so that would be something to think about. So how would you defend it? Um, <laughs> sounding more and more like dune sandworms. Yeah. But, but there's giant centipedes. I'm just thinking like, why is they the same thing? But but I don't want them to like burrow and come up and eat from underground. I want them to like stay above ground when you fight them. Um, I don't want that element of surprise really against them because they have a hard exterior shell. You'd have to have some kind of like siege weapons of some sort. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, without having, I guess you could you could have piercing siege weapons that might work. Um, that's why they build the city in the chasm. So the sandworms can't get them. Yeah, actually that would make sense. And so maybe, maybe there's like a horns, maybe their defense mechanism is to go underground. <laughs> maybe that's what it is. They just retreat underground. Um, perhaps there's a wall built that goes underground. Yeah. Like a barrier. That'd be cool. Uh, I got a group of desert orcs in my world that have mastered w worm antsing, uh, which is essentially magically controlling the native worms to use as beasts of burden, war companions, and mounts. I love it. That's cool. S desert orcs. I, I have desert orcs as well in my Orcs Arrow Peninsula, as well as desert dwarves um, from the Western Dwarven Territory. So that's cool adamantine bricks i love that you you mentioned that so i like um the idea also of eventually having a bunch of different materials in my world that like weapons can be made out of and then you know having certain perks um maybe some mechanical or whatever you know like typically you would think elven weapons would be lighter You'd think dwarven weapons might be hardier, uh, stronger, so they'd have they'd be harder to break, um, things like that. Um, I've also toyed with the idea of trying to build in um, uh, alchemy type of ingredients, and you know, mixing certain things from my setting create different things. I've toyed around with that idea um, for my setting because I think that would be cool as well. Orcs equal dorks. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, maybe they have to make vibrations in the ground to mimic dragons plodding through the sand by using drums. Keep the um, centipedes away. That would be interesting. Uh, Glass-tipped arrows that do extra damage, but the tips shatter. Yeah, like what? Like single-use arrows. That'd be cool. Uh, obsidian is a heart material. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. I love all of it. Um, yeah, so in that world, which did I put that map away? I totally put the map I did have out away. Um, ooh, cool, found something, found the thing I was, I was I wanted to work on later, so that's cool. Um, 
my world, there is... I don't remember what I was going to say. Damn. Totally got distracted by finding my Anvil Ringers one-page write-up. Um, I have a three-page write-up that was has more, like, secrets about the group. Because um, I had shared... I had This one-page write-up I shared with um, their characters once. But, yeah, my... Shoot, what did I do with that map? I'm really bummed now that I did that. Oh, I put it right here. It's got to be in this folder. Uh, in my world. So, pulling the map out again. I am very glad I invited you guys here to build this for me. Uh, I don't know if I'll use all the ideas, but I like a lot of the ideas, and they get me thinking. So, that's awesome. Uh, there's a town in New Orleans they call the Rising Sun. Um, so... Again, this is here. That's a pretty fantastic location. Uh, up here, this is where Orcs Arrow Peninsula is. Um, there is, on the western side, is western side of the mountains, is, is where, here, let me show a better map. Nate from WASD20 made this for me. So, and he actually did it on one of his first map mapping videos, too. So, uh, the western dwarven territories, which are over here, um, that's more desert. Uh, the Orcs Arrow Peninsula has three, there's only a couple shown in here, but there's three um, Orc tribes or Orc cities, uh, which are actually controlled by dragons. Um, yeah, Nate's cool. I, I used, he used to game in my home group, so that was always pretty pretty awesome. Um, but they, these three cities, uh, Orc cities, are run by dragons. And until recently, these orcs in this area have never got along. They've always even war. They were at war with each other and the dwarves of the north. Um, and so that was a big deal. Now, there's a couple things th that are that I find awesome about this portion. First of all, I did a video way back that started with the Orcs Arrows Peninsula. That was my very first world building for you know journey into this where i started my world it's not very good <laughs> i've went back and watched it. i'm like oh it wasn't as good as i remembered but um the eastern dwarven territories is uh a really it's got one main dwarven city surface city they're like samurai so imagine like asian culture um or japanese culture with these dwarves no beards top knots you know, fantastic armor, weapons, things like that. In some cases, people think that the, their weapons are better than they are. Um, but yeah, imagine samurai, ninjas, things like that. Those are the type of dwarves here. Uh, the Western Dwarven territory, the dwarves there are more um, barbarians, just savages. Think like Genghis Khan. Okay. Um Still really smart, still really good with warfare, things like that. Good stuff. Up here, doesn't say it on here, but this is my City of the Ancients. It's an elven city. It's very stereotypical elven. Pirate's Bay, you know, seafaring adventures. And Elda, the first known human uh, settlement, is the largest city in my whole setting. I want fantastical stuff there, there, and there so the dwarven eastern dwarven territory is surrounded by imagine like a great wall um you know that's how i envision it it's got this huge wall that surrounds the territory there's several towns within the wall um but then there's the main city as well um, but they just call it the eastern dwarven territories they don't even name the towns or cities um like a normal city or town at least they haven't yet maybe i'll change that in my setting yeah, and then up here, Pine Run. That's just, there's really not much fantastical up up there. Um, Chitin, uh, imagine like flying, a lot of flying creatures, uh, hippogriffs and griffins and things like that that are used by people to travel, deliver messages and things like that. Um, Sandstrom is a city that's primarily elven run. Um Eagle View is similar to Chitin. You know, obviously, a lot of flying things. Um, Manderton's a pretty cool city. But but none of that stuff really has anything... Well, I say too over the top, but I got, like, a lot of flying creatures and flying 
transportation there. So maybe I'm wrong there. Um, so I guess there is a lot of fantastic stuff, I guess, in my setting now that I look back on it. But I, I again, it's not like everybody can do it. Uh, in my, the way I've envisioned it, it's, um, it's still pretty rare. Now, this right here, so this is my world map again. So obviously that features this area that I've kind of went over with you guys. Um, I've ran one shots in this portion. So I ran a game called the Black, oh, sorry, I'm not flipping you guys off. Uh, the Black Lake, that takes place there. Uh, in fact, two one shots. I had that one and I had another one around the same time uh, back then. Both of those one shots took place there. Uh, ran a few games of a campaign here. This is swampy. Um, on one side of the mountain, there's a ton of swamps. Uh, think bullywogs, hags, werewolves. Um, in fact, a lot of the more, what I would say, horror-themed things might take place in this region. Uh, I haven't finished mapping everything there. I haven't mapped all my islands yet, and I haven't mapped all this stuff up even up here. This continent right here is probably one of the more fleshed-out continents. I've got all the cities named, uh, pretty much everything there. Um, and then up here is where I've ran a one-shot for my, um, for, what was it? Frozen Chosen for Brigade Con. And uh, this is called the Glass Coast because ice washes up on the, sh on the shores here, and it looks like glass. So they call it the Glass Coast. Um, so that's kind of the world, a, a quick overview of my world. Um, I don't have a ton of fantastic things here. Uh, I do have some of like like giants. I do have a lot of dragons, not a lot, a few dragons here. Um, this continent is almost always in turmoil. Whether it's they unify to fight a greater evil, but then they go to war with some of each other. Like it's just it, there's always a greater evil rising up there. Um, so I've, I've enjoyed doing that a lot. Um, yeah, so again, I've done most of my gaming in here and then up in here. And I'm, I'm looking forward to doing some more out there. But um, when it comes to the like the lumberjack stuff, I love the idea of the Goliath lumberjacks from earlier today. Uh, putting that somewhere in here, uh, I think that would be cool. Somewhere like dead center in here. Uh, I think that would be awesome. Um, and so that means I need to make a strong Goliath presence in that area. Uh, you know, again, serpents and lizard men up in this, you know, the desert area would be cool. Maybe even up into the mountains a little. Um, up here, I have more orcs and goblins. Uh, down here, a ton of orcs. Um, men's very common. Um, up in here, so north of Elda, a lot of halflings. So <laughs> always a greater evil playing D&D in a nutshell. Yeah, like that one continent, I want it to feel very much like D&D. You know, your typical, what you would expect d and I've thrown a Horde of the Dragon Queen. I've ran it into that continent, changing some of the stuff. I've done some, um, what else? I thought I'd use some other stuff. Yeah, Horde of the Dragon Queen. I don't know. I use some stuff from published modules. Oh, uh, yeah, what the heck? What is it? Why am I not thinking right? Oh, Princes of the Apocalypse. I've taken some things from Princes of the Apocalypse and ran them in that as well. Um, changing the names of things, but using cults. Um, my eight pillars of death take place on that continent. Um, you know, so, you know, one of the pillars to give you an idea was the dragon cult from Horde of the Dragon Queen. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your, so you guys are talking about a yurt. <laughs> uh, the modern ones are more permanent. Uh, it's a, mo a modern yurt, if that's what you're asking. Cool, cool. I'll have to Google it later. What's up, everyone? What's up, Juice? Hey, thanks for joining Logos, Sarsgard. Um, I appreciate you joining me. We're just talking about some world building, basically talking about my world and then adding some stuff to it. We got some cool stuff for the my desert city, so I'm really happy about that. Uh, someday I'll make a world where the map has one of the polar ice caps in the middle. <laughs> you would. <laughs> so what? Your world would have two suns and your planet like goes between them, but it never like rotates or something. So now you have a polar ice cap around the middle. That would be kind of cool, like a polar barrier between. Maybe I'll do another world and steal your idea. <laughs> uh, 
someday I will make a map with an ice cap. Turmoil. So it's like America. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Always a great at even playing D&D in a nutshell. Goliath tribe. That's a tall order. You know, I, I like it. Um, the thing is, typically when I went when I have Goliaths, I make them really small tribes, um, really small groups. Uh, I don't make them really large, like upwards of 20 max, usually. Uh, I was just going to ask where the halflings are from. Yeah, I try to think where would my where would they have originated and where would they have gone from there? And that's where so like a lot of so in the dwarven territory, so let me pull that back up. And I had talked about it in the very first video I ever did. The Western Dwarven Territory, which has the, the yurt looking thing, uh, is where uh, elves, orcs, and dwarves all came from. So in those mountains, the Savage Mountains, they came to above ground. They're actually all from underground in my setting. They're all underground, and it came up and then evolved. And when they came up they were living both above and underground but earthquakes and things like that um, closed the entrance back to most of their civilization so they had to adapt and learn to live above ground um so even so the western dwarves and the eastern territory dwarves are all surface dwarves um the elves that went to the forest they went there to get away from the war between the dwarves the orcs kind of were just slaves. They were pushed to the south because there's not, it's more barren. Um, there's not a ton down in the south there. Um, there's a lake in the south where the, the orcs sacrifice fellow orcs and like anything you can think of. But it's it's a blood red lake. And it's because they've they've made so many sacrifices there that it's it's you know it's so much blood in that lake is my idea and uh i one of the things i want to do is make an orcish necromancer um as a, a big bad talked about and that you know either i will use one day or maybe if i make this a free download or a charge or whatever you know maybe that'll be so, some inspiration for someone to use um you could put in a temperate rainforest south of your swamp oh okay yeah, yeah, no, that that makes sense. Near my Bog Sylvania, <laughs> I stole that name. I don't. I'll probably change that name at some point. Laugh at it, but yeah. Um, okay, so what's next then, sir? We've got a world to build here, and there's only six days left. <laughs> uh, will there be any under dark? Yes, I have various portions. So in the desert, like we were talking about before. Um, I want levels in the Underdark and, you know, roads, you know, out away from it that go into the large, the huge mountains here. Um, so down in here, this little icon, I don't know if you can see it real well. Skyrim stuff back in the day. But yeah, that little icon is the city. Underground there is multiple tiers of the city that then have roads to the Underdark and you can travel to the mountains, even probably underwater over the Orcs Arrow Peninsula, maybe. Um, which I think would be kind of cool. Um, but all um, underground travel, I think, would be cool to have some kind of system that you could travel the whole world underground, I think would be awesome. Well, no need for two suns. Just have the view from over the pole. Gold in the, <laughs> gold in the middle, hot around the edges. Oh, cold. You said gold, but I think you meant cold. Let's just go with gold. Gold sounds better. Oh, and then you corrected yourself. Uh, Blood Red Lake sounds like an algae problem. <laughs> maybe it is. Maybe it's, it's you know, for all the science people out there, maybe it is an algae problem. Um, Blood Lake equals high iron content. There you go. Now you just got to get Magneto out there and he can pull it all out. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, I think the next area... You know, I kind of like that. Maybe I'll just start doing it where we just plan on certain areas and we just talk about the areas. Because I think I got a lot more doing that than trying to talk about just the mundane things in my setting. Um, so, yeah, let me grab a pencil. I got one right here. Let's, let's just work on it that way. What do you guys think? Does that sound like fun? 
I think it does. I guess that's all that matters, right? Uh, so I'm just going to make some notes here. Boom. So we said cent giant centipedes. Check. Good and bad. Well, no, not good or bad. Uh, domestic and wild. There we go. Love it. And I'll have to go back and watch this, but that was a big thing that stood out to me. And I'll, I'll do some more things there. Um, sure, we've been more productive in refining your idea of one area. I agree. I think it's been more, more helpful there. Um, so you guys said a rainforest, like short of the swampy area. So that'd be cool. So I'll just write on here rainforest. I'll have to look. I might have a more detailed map somewhere for that too. Um, cause I, what I do is I, I make these folders for my campaigns and stuff in there. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna come back and make notes later. But, um, so this is what I did. So I wrote rainforest in the area we had talked about. Now I may actually have fleshed that out a bit more in a different campaign that was up here, but I have to find that folder. Um, I think I did. And I think even to the, to the, you know, over here, I was thinking like, um, um, kind of like a dictator rulership that, um, city where, and it wasn't going to be a big city, but the rulers just kind of, they had slaves, but they kind of kept it hush hush, um, real cruel to their citizens, citizens, um, didn't really allow a lot of, um, in fact, charged people to leave the city, large amounts of money, which then kept the poor in the city. So the poor couldn't even like find a way to survive out in the wilderness because they're stuck in these districts because there's taxes to travel to different districts. Um, and I, I think I actually have a couple cities that are sort of like that in my setting, but, um, but yeah, <laughs> can't have dictators without taters. Or dicks. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so I thought that would be cool um, to have like a small city that's walled in that has a couple districts. And, uh, you know, they just don't allow their poor to leave, you know, um, and kind of stick them in one area. And it, it is what it is. Now, can population know that there? Maybe. But it's normal. And uh, in other places um do they know about it i would probably say no if they found out about it maybe there'd be some push for liberation for for freedom uh, you know to to go and free them deliver deliver some uh good old-fashioned freedom to their front door um could have it be a temperate rainforest like the pacific northwest you could have an albino spirit bear hmm interesting interesting well if you got if you have a rainforest you definitely have to have a volcano somewhere too then i can make it like tomb of annihilation right there i could run tomb of annihilation right there i'm writing that down tomb of annihilation there we go although that's an island isn't it ah, i could alter it i could make it like surrounded by really wide rivers or something or maybe I just move that off there to the, the island near it. Maybe I'll do that. Um, gonna have to finish watching later. Hey, thanks for stopping in, Daniel. Danielle, Daniel, 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 Daniel. I don't know. Psych. <laughs> uh, thanks for tuning in. I'll, I'll catch you later. On the peninsula of Washington. Poor people aren't well known for their mobility. Very true, especially in medieval settings i believe they can only like times it was very common for most of the population to not travel more than 20 miles from home so so that's true um definitely true um until the poor people mob yeah they can mob but they're they're not gonna be right um they probably get their food from the government because they're poor and so i would say they're mal they're malnourished um and they probably don't want to prevent you know the government from giving them their food so 
mob. I mean, come on. There are so many people angry right now in America, and they're not really mobbing. They're doing peaceful protests. Uh, I was thinking it would be interesting to have a lava flow at the bottom of the desert chasm. So it's hot on the surface and hot down on the bottom. That, yeah, I like that. And maybe down there is where they forge weapons. Um, you know, maybe they use the lava flow to help them forge weapons. Um, I I remember playing, I went and played a Pathfinder Society game once. And, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> So Paul says, I was making a lousy joke about mobility and mobs. Me, I took everything literal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I played a Pathfinder Society game once where, I don't know if you ever played Pathfinder Society. Um, you you kind of just, when you sit down to play, you're like at the entrance of where you're going pretty much. Like you kind of get like a couple minutes before your your group travels out sometimes like to buy stuff or whatever. Um, but then it's like, boom, you're there. And sitting at the table, you're usually at the dungeon, per se. And I don't remember a lot about it, um, like the details. But I think we were in like the desert area uh, south in Galarian at a, um, what is it called? Like a valley. And then there was like an opening and then there was the entrance to the dungeon. And as soon as we went in, it was like super hot and there's lava here and lava there. And then you have to watch out and jump over lava rivers and stuff like that. And they had like a forge and I mean, it was cool. I remember the stuff about it because um, I thought it was really cool and there were some interesting things. Um, some stuff that we just didn't explore much, unfortunately, because I think we we had left like magic items. So usually to get the magic items, you gotta like come up with some creative, you know, thinking, um, you know. And the group was just hack and slash, and so we didn't think outside the box really. Um, but yeah, yes, the weak, starving, unarmed masses pile their bodies up against the walls of the castle until they can overrun it. <laughs> Modular games are easier to manage that way. Yes, yes. I uh, can't believe I almost missed this. No, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Numbing disaster. Anon? Anon? Anon. Um, cool. How hot it was. I Yeah, I remember, um, you know, the DM, like we would go into certain rooms and the DM would really emphasize how hot it is in there. And I, I liked that. It reminds me of a one shot I played with uh, Andrew Knapp in a desert as well. But um, what I was getting to was that that Pathfinder Society game when we went in and it was so hot, that would be perfect, like you were saying, in the bottom levels of that desert city. Um, and maybe it's got two different names. Maybe above ground it's got a name. I don't know. I'd have, I'll have to come up with a name. But then underground has a different name or maybe just the whole underground portion just has a, a name that's unique. Uh, and different than the surface name of the city. I don't know. Maybe that's stupid. <laughs> um, I'm never a fan of hack and slash groups. Some straightforward violence is fun in moderation, but got to get the critical skills out there. You know, I used to think that I was a hack and slash player. I think I, I do still enjoy that. It just depends on my mood. But um, playing with the provokers... I think, you know, for season one, I think that opened my eyes to a lot of stuff. I think playing in a lot of games in the one-shot group opened my eyes to what it would really be. Um, you know, I have a... Compared to four years ago, my tastes in games have changed. I used to, Well, here's the funny thing is, is I've also went more towards miniature gaming. I prefer miniature gaming now, too, rather than not miniature gaming. So it's funny. I went from... Liking combat a lot and being more about that for the mind to then being more sto like story, I guess, is one way to put it. But you can tell a story with combat, too. But being more character focused, that there's a good way to say it. Character focused, but I like miniatures more. So, yeah, um, it's 
it's kind of funny because most people associate miniature gamers as more hack and slash. Uh, at least I always thought of it that way. Um, keep your city name, but call the districts top side, the walls, etc. Yeah. I, I kind of like the, the the idea too, like we were saying, is one of the defense mechanisms is to go underground, you know, when they see the giant centipedes stampeding towards the city or something. Black corridor for the underground town. And then call the town on the surface over black corridor. Yeah, I could do something like that for sure. Hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that um, interests me too about stuff like that is having have large cities. There has to be some kind of a resource for why there's a large city there. What is the main resource? We talked about the, the one fruit, but what about for war? Because, you know, isn't a lot of technology inspired or created because of war, you know? So maybe a rare metal, maybe gunpowder. Um, I don't want guns in my setting necessarily. Um, but I, I don't mind the idea of having a rare, a very rare, like gunpowder that can be used for different things. Um glass of course that makes sense because of sand um definitely that would work uh, and then the sand mixed with the lava is where they come up with their their glass arrow tips and stuff i'm cool with that uh, with cities in my worlds i tend to like naming them after nebulous concepts an exploited resource or named after a certain being whether by their deeds status or their name uh, i do too uh pine run is a great example surrounded by pine trees um elda was is i got the name from elders you know it's that was my thing and it was the very first human establishment or settlement so that's why i kind of came up with that and just was like elders it's the eldest city the oldest city boom elda <laughs> Um, city of Ancients, same kind of deal. It's an old city. It's the very first elven establishment. Um, Eastern and Western Dwarven territory, because again, you have them two factions, basically. Uh, the orcs are in the south. The bottom of the peninsula is shaped like an arrowhead, orcs arrow. Um, obviously, that's not based on the resources, but it's based on geographical things. Um, a place called Tiembre Falls. Uh, which it means like shadow, um, shadow falls. Um, and actually that came from a superhero city I had. So when I played Heroes Unlimited by Palladium Books, we had um, real world settings, but I was like, you know what? I kind of want to go into some more fantastic things. And I was talking to a guy about, because I live in Michigan, obviously, uh, I was talking to a guy about, you know, what would be a cool name for a fictional city like Detroit or this or that. And we came up with Tiembre Falls. Um, so that's that's where that's from. Funny. So I have that in this setting. And then because there's a city called Bay City here in Michigan, I just threw a city called Bay City north of it, <laughs> which is a bay. But, yeah. Uh, I have the misfortune of never being too big into game of thrones and named a city king's landing and now very little people want anything to do with it because they think i'm copying game of thrones so maybe change it to queen's landing i mean that would work dragon's landing that'd be a good one uh what else could we call it i'm gonna i might take some of these, these names I like dragon's landing that'd be kind of cool um what else? Eagle Landing, which I have Eagle View, name from the Eagles. Um, Sandstrom is not a sand-based city at all. Uh, I don't know why I came up with that name. Brower Hans, uh, I, that's a dwarven above-ground city um, that gets its um, ore from Sandstrom and Pine Run. Depends on the day. Uh, I had a campaign where where Nate from WSD twenty was playing in it my friend dustin nicole my wife a couple other people played in it periodically and 
in that campaign, the players caused a war between Pine Run and Sandstrom. It was not something I ever planned. Um, they So they freed some mines near Pine Run. When they freed those mines up, the, the mines were able to open again and go back to business. Well, Sandstrom originally was the exporter to Brower Hans, and I didn't think anything of it, but killed a bunch of Sandstrom guards that were off duty uh, on the way to Brower Hans. And so it was set up that, hey, Pine Run just opened up selling ore to Brower Hans, killed a bunch of Sandstrom guards, and now there's this tension there, um, which... So I have it here, right? So Sandstrom's here, Pine Run's here. There's a mountain that divides it, and then they kind of meet up at the top near Brower Hans. So it's this little area. It's like, but you can't really go over the mountain to attack. It's just, it's near impossible. So you still have to go around and through Brower Hans. So Brower Hans is in the middle, having to decide. They side with, depending on the day. But yeah, so that was kind of cool. I kind of... Of like I'm gonna leave that in there that Pine Run and Sandstrom are they hate each other basically because of something this player group did. Um, I like I like that. Um, I'm back again, but I might be hopping in and out for the next little bit. Hey, not a problem. I don't know how long I'm gonna do this. It's like 1:30 here, so and I gotta get my daughter on the bus at eight in the morning. But whatever. <laughs> Kingsport is a good substitute. I, I like that too. That's a cool name. Port is used like everywhere. I just never heard King's Landing anywhere. And I wanted to name it the King himself spearheaded exploration of the new world. And that was the first place. I like that. I don't have a problem with stealing names from other settings. I think it's a good idea, to be honest. Uh, that he arrived at the state and staked his claim there personally. Uh, I mess with names a lot. Nor Nosr Nasratap is a familiar name to you, so perhaps modify it. No trip, not trapaz, no trip. I don't know how you even say that. Is <laughs> a slight shuffle of letters. Ending. Royal Port, Royal Bay, King's Bay, King's Nest. All excellent names. I like taking words. King, Queen, Knight, you know, whatever. You click, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. Love taking things like that. You can add things like um hall landing port bay uh falls um pass like just just generic words like you can make generators for this kind of stuff really easily um love it peninsula um yeah all sorts of good things so so i i, I like it you can totally play with you know just a couple words and boom there you go uh how about take your last name and say it backwards then shuffle the letters a little just a thought roost river mount hill yeah exactly exactly um peaks there's a good one um yeah add the word new at the beginning or old there's another thing you can do old king's landing new king's landing new false old river falls you know all sorts of cool things once you start mixing those words up so i, I love it um yeah so uh what else what can i get back to i would because i'm now i'm talking about naming conventions which is kind of funny but um i took something that my players did and i put it in here i i a lot of the stuff i usually do is i build it based off of one shot and that's how i flush it out um, so the, doing it this way, where I like just sit here and talk about it with you guys and just put things in there, is a new way for me to world build. World build as I prep for games, um, and it's usually real small. I, you know, obviously I have a map of my world, and then I just am like, okay, I'm going to do a one shot. This is what's going to be like. Okay, that makes sense for this place, and then I just play it. <laughs> and then as I play it, whatever I improv ends up part of the setting. That's that's normally how I world build. Um, I'm trying to be more um so yeah old river falls is a red name yeah i like it it's totally gonna be you know i came up with that so i'm oh yeah i'm using it i'm not stealing it because it's my own <laughs> uh, but i love it um 
All right. Since the topic is about magic and tech for everyday life, can I go off current topic for a bit to say a bit of magic tech I always loved because of Sacred 2 that I never see much anywhere? Yes. Definitely. I'm totally about that. Uh, taking magic and make it a physical thing like oil, magic oil, and then take it to fuel technology. Yes. Too. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there is no gunpowder in a world because it's all magically made. But wizards and or whoever don't want to make it because it can kill them <laughs> it's dangerous so maybe it's hard to get a wizard to make it or something that'd be kind of cool maybe that's how i'll do it and it's very expensive again always expensive anything technological or magical is expensive dance magic yeah like name your desert city old old lakeland <laughs> uh that that simple thing is very mind blowing to me. Powering tech with physical magic. Yes, I like it. I, I think that's something. Well, I don't know if you were here early on. We were trying to come up with why this city would exist in the middle of a desert. You know, originally it was a forest or a rainforest that dried up magically. Well, the survivors survive and stay in their city. And so they came up with this fruit um, that they manufactured, basically. At least that's how I envisioned it. I don't know if we talked about it like that. But that's how I envisioned it. And, um, you know, they magically make it so there's running water. Um, I think I'd originally described it as a good berry, but not a good berry. So, so yeah, I guess that kind of implies that it was magically manufactured. Um Downside of that is it's very, very, very radioactive and corrupts everything. You know, speaking of corruption, that reminds me of Dragon Age when you had the, um, oh gosh, what is it? I played all the games. Uh, it's the the lyrium. They had the red lyrium and it corrupts people. So yeah, that's kind of cool. I, I like the idea of that. Um, maybe there's no magic in the world because it's all tech. Maybe. Who is it that said that any technology, if advanced enough, is indistinguishable from magic? I don't know, but I've heard that before. I've heard that saying. Uh, Paul says, how I world build during session is I have about a 100-page random table that makes random events, towns, curiosities, and landmarks. It is pretty fun. Uh, maybe battery and keyboard is powering down. Uh, in... A desert, usually trade route, convenience, and oasis are the reasons anyone founds cities in the desert. Well, see, my idea is that the city was already in the desert because it wasn't a desert before. And so as the forest around it started to die from the outside in, they found a way to preserve the city and actually make it better. And they, the desert is a natural protection from anybody trying to go to war with them. But there had to be resources there for them to want to stay there you know such as someone had said glass uh, maybe their forges that are underground um you know because of the, the access to lava maybe the access to the underground roads um maybe there's ancient artifacts there that they can't move maybe there's something that if they try to move it will kill them but they need it there and they need to protect it and keep it from you know, evil or keep it from super religious people or whatever. Um, easy. In the desert, the city built there because there's this massive chasm that gave easy access to mining. I like that too. I love, I do like that. So I don't know if you guys are familiar. There's a group on Facebook called D and D DMs only. And there's a guy who posted a thing about a, chasm around his city it's the only city or it was the only city um great he i think he said great evils came and wild beasts basically overran everything but this great chasm kept this one city alive and they have magical force fields and whatever and it's overcrowded but because it was overcrowded some wizards went to form their own cities and he said one city is on the back of like a gigantic um massive a stone golem with like four legs and it's a traveling like mobile city but when he was talking about the chasm and what you just said made me think of that and that was just tonight like i thought it was a really cool idea i don't want any mobile cities i don't think in my setting at least not in this portion of my world which 
I think this is about one sixth or one eighth of my world. Like I said, I, I imagine there being another section down here like this, same size roughly. And I imagine it being at least, you know, more going that way too. Um, you know, so this is a small portion of my world, but I, I want this to be my main portion right now. Um, I don't want travel like mobile cities. Uh, I do like the idea of incorporating a bunch of tropes. I kind of want to infuse a lot of different uh, inspired cultures from real world into this. Um, you know, what I do outside of that, I'm not sure. I might even have large portions of like this, like maybe all this over here is just water for, you know, basically this whole sheet worth of size. Um, I like the idea of having a, what is it? Uh, what's it called when it like starts like a drain in water? Um, basically like a downward spiral of water that actually goes down into like maybe an under, not underwater, but a city down at the bottom of this. I think something like that might be kind of cool. Uh, I just don't know if, I don't know if I can do that and make it make sense. So maybe it's a portal to another world. That'd be kind of interesting. Um, maybe it is on a wellspring of magic too. It, that could be. Uh, well, thanks to the fact that the first civilizations are found in deserts, there are also the oldest tales of the magic and sorcerers from the deserts. Middle East is considered the birthplace of magic. Hmm, interesting. Maybe we could impose a mythos that deserts and magic have a greater connection and that by suddenly being in a desert, they have easier access to magic and just go ham with concepts thereof. I think that would be cool. Like maybe there's more uh, experimentation in the desert uh, because it it works. It's more efficient there. Uh, even go as far as crazy to suggest that combining desert mythos with physical magic that Oasis came up with instead of water, but magic oil. Whirlpool. Yeah, Whirlpool. There you go. Thank you. Maelstrom. Uh, maybe there's the bones of an old god buried deep beneath they have been mining the dead god's bones. So it's funny you mention that. So religion and deities in my world, I go back and forth on this, was uh, I thought, okay, everything could be faith-based, but you know, you didn't have access to deities. Then I thought, well, what if people believe in deities because they see these greater, these powerful beings, right? These immortals. And really though the magic comes from the stars um i kind of like that idea so that you know you could definitely say that like oh deity died and his bones are here and they're they're trying to get him out um but he's not an old god yeah no i like that i actually i ran a campaign where the one in pine run area where the bad guys there was a cult that was rebuilding a god um by taking sacrifices and these petrified organs that were once this gods that have been spread out and uh he was a multi the god was a multi-class cleric and sorcerer i believe um so i love that idea definitely love that idea of like an old god that may not really be a god and i think i can have it make sense in my setting by saying that nobody really knows if these immortals are really gods or not but they're so powerful that they're believed to be gods and they can communicate you know with with many beings across the planet or something. I don't know. Um, but I want them to have a physical place, kind of like Mount Olympus, but I want them to have an actual location on my planet that they just don't leave their island, though. Maybe there's a barrier that doesn't allow them to, and if they leave, they lose their immortality. Uh, what if the gods that made the world were really just a bunch of nerds sitting in their basements talking about a game? I know, right? Crazy idea. <laughs> Uh, Middle East and parts of the of the cradle of creation were not always desert. Times changed, and so has climate. Yes, and I definitely want to incorporate that into my world. Um, definitely want to. Um, you know, evolution is a thing in my world. Uh, I definitely want to do that. Um, just to comprehend the fact that they exist. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, okay, I missed something. Okay, that was always the scariest thing about the Lovecraft mythos. The gods weren't really gods. 
just natural beings so ancient and powerful in the cosmos that we have no choice but to call them gods. Yes, just to comprehend the fact that they exist. Yes, I see. I love that idea. Um, you know, and I, I want the so magic in my setting. I'm, I'm thinking it's based on um, astrology, right? So, like everybody in my setting could have magic, but many believe you learn it through, with you know, being a wizard. Studies makes sense. Some believe they're born with it because they naturally are good at it. Think of like a natural athlete like LeBron James. He's just naturally awesome. Um, warlocks think that they get it from this pact, which maybe they do. Maybe that's that's because this creature, maybe it's a devil or whatever, does. Maybe they're so well-versed in magic that they're able to give it to somebody who can't normally do it. Um, but you don't technically need the pact, maybe. Uh, clerics, they believe, you know, they have this strong faith. And so that's why they are able to. It's like the placebo effect. Like, oh, okay, I can do this because I took this sugar pill that I think is not a sugar pill. You know, I love the idea of toying with that idea. Uh, one thing, one of my favorite YouTubers, Plague of Grips, talks about with world building that you don't see too often that I also wish people considered is food. Oh, are you going to have 27 varieties of cockatrice with different shaped beaks and colored feathers? I would love to do that, actually. Uh, not many people understand how something as simple as what the people eat on a day-to-day -day basis is very important to a nation's culture. I agree. That's why one of the first things we did was come up with um, that fruit. Uh, I think we called it the sun heart fruit. Um, it needs extreme heat uh, from the sun to grow. When you cut it open, it bleeds juices that look like blood. And uh, so that's why we called it the sun heart fruit. And I, I came up with the idea that, you know, maybe bards and performers use the fruit. They come here, they buy the fruit, and they use it in their performances to fake blood, like maybe for theater and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I like it. Uh, but yeah, so Paul, what you said, I, I see, I think changing one monster could be different here than over here. Maybe it's the color, maybe it's, you know, how big it is. I love that idea. Think of deer, right? I don't know where all of you guys live. You know, there's deer hunting all over the place. You go from one place, the deer are like 30 pounds lighter than another place. Um, you know, just something to think about. So uh probably lots of beans some nice peppers i you know i like the idea of having some peppers in the desert <laughs> some hot peppers ghost peppers phantom peppers they're hotter than ghost peppers how about that i don't even know if that's a real thing phantom peppers let's call them phantom peppers uh bleeding fruit with the juices that look like fruit <laughs> it reminds me of my delightfully evil blood mage character with his devious and genius means of streamlining literal blood wine. That look like blood. Oh, I wonder if they dry the sunheart fruit and make something like dates. <laughs> you know, again, I told you guys before, I was thinking of ways that I could use um, made up plants, fruits, stone, metals, or whatever. Uh, for alchemy. I know that's not alchemy, but, you know, making like um, sun heart raisins <laughs> or dates or whatever uh, could be something to take into account with that for sure. I like it. I love that idea. Um, hmm. Dude, blood, blood mages and blood magic is kind of cool. I, I really wish that they incorporated that into 5e somehow. Um, a while back, there was a sorceress. You can find this on my website, rpgjuice.com. There is a, in the download section, there's a download called Sorceress Origins. I did not make it. Uh, I believe Chepe from, he used to have a channel called Fawn Trodden. I don't know where he's at these days. Um, he made this, PDF called Sorceress Origins, 
and it was he took five e sorcerers and made different archetypes. One was like a Medusa one, which I love. His blood blood sorcerer is sweet. Love it. And I know other people have done it too, um, but I love Chepe's version of it for the sorcerer. I thought that was awesome. Um, have you considered bees? I have not considered bees. So this has lots of alchemical parallels. Perhaps brandy from Datewine. Hmm. Yeah, like there's a lot of things to consider for sure. Um, could make a whole supplement for a world that's just about things like that. You know, I mean, that's what's crazy about all this. Um, you know, obviously you want to leave some stuff up to DMs or to players and things like that. But uh, I think having little things peppered throughout, you know, these different areas is, is awesome. There's one thing that is doomed to happen is the discovery and consumption of alcohol, <laughs> right? Yeah, maybe this fruit makes like the most potent alcohol like ever. I don't know. I like it. Alcohol is very important to a culture as well. Yes. So are hallucinogen <laughs> hallucinogens. Like I guess a lot of... Uh, tribes like in forests trip out <laughs> on some stuff like i've heard of it like african tribes doing stuff the mayans i think used to do stuff freaking vikings used to get high and get all crazy and think they saw spirits alcohol spirits is because we thought it was an extraction of the quintessence quintessence yeah, quintessence i can't even say that word I don't think I've ever seen that word. But yeah, it's fascinating. It really is. Um, all right. So I think what I'm going to do, I appreciate all of this, definitely. I think I'm going to try and flesh out my desert city a little more using some of the stuff we talked about. That's cool. I'm going to try and uh, finish up my anvil ringers right up uh, and maybe incorporate some of this setting stuff into that. And uh, maybe from there, maybe I'll have something in a couple weeks that I can share in my Master of the Game group on Facebook. They could have a pepper so spicy that if you're not used to it, you hallucinate. I love it. Definitely. It'd be the phantom peppers. I'm writing that down, by the way. You got the sun heart fruit, which is huge. Very important. And then you're going to have the phantom peppers, which again, if there's phantom peppers already, let me know. I'll come up with a different name. Like call it poltergeist peppers or something. I just like to play off the, the ghost peppers idea. Um, but it, hopefully I can get something like this written up in the next week. I think that would be cool. Um, put it in my anvil ringers right up that I've been meaning to get. Unload. And uh, yeah. One thing I love with desert villages and mysticism is have some sort of sacred animal, just like the Simpsons episode. I love it. Hmm. Oh, sorry. That's two different people. Just like the Simpsons episode. I love it. <laughs> uh, my favorite example, so this is from Numbing Disaster. My favorite example is from Egyptian mythos with albino crocodiles. You know, I'm. it's kind of interesting. I'm you know, hippos uh, being like the most dangerous animal in the world or something like that. Isn't that true? Um, specter peppers. Oh, I like it. Specter pepper. I want to write that down too. Yeah, I like that. Um, the rule is that you're going to build a world. You should do it in six days. <laughs> I can't write that fast, but I agree. I think, you know what, that'd be cool to do a world in six days. Can can you write that much? I'm just going to look at something. I'm very curious now that you just said that. Let me look at Forgotten Realms campaign setting. Let's see how big this is. Uh, 320 pages, roughly. So, six days, you're doing 50 pages. Pages to do that book in six days. <laughs> 
seven days early, right? What? Okay, what about? Let's look at let me move my dice box. Let's just look at the Inner Sea World Guide real quick. Let's just see. It's got to be 280 or so. Nope. 317 pages for that. Okay. What about the Inner Sea Gods? Oh, whoops, that's not what I wanted. Just religion alone. How many pages did they write? Which I can't imagine writing this many pages. 320 pages. I can't imagine writing that many pages just for gods. That blows my mind. Anything else like that? Whoops. Uh, I don't think I have anything else, really. Sword Coast Adventures Guide. I'm not a fan of that book, by the way. That's probably my least favorite D&D book for 5th edition is Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Or whatever. Is that what it's called? Yeah, that's what it's called. That's my least favorite book that I bought since 5th edition came out. Um, <laughs> let's see. All right. Numbing disaster said making them the ultimate signs of good fortune and blessings from the gods. Uh, will depicts humans are more dangerous than hippos. Okay. Yes. I'll give you that. <laughs> Dude, that's a crazy world. Uh, will depicts. Yes, you can do it. Josh Bingham. I've been working on my world for like six years. Yeah, I've been working on mine for years as well. Paul, hippos can snap a man's thigh in half with a bite. Show me a person who can do that. You just need outlines, not details. The details come when the players encounter it. I agree. Um, definitely. Uh, numbing disaster. I had a Sultan character who has an albino crocodile for a pet. In the universe, though, they can grow to the size of buses is because of this crocodile not many assassinate him because risk of curse will depicts humans kill more than hippos yes they do paul i agree with Dwayne. outlines and fill it in with players best bet to get people playing in the world for sure for sure i'm, I'm down with that uh josh, Bing josh bingham i better head to bed definitely watching the rest later later guys night josh have a good one thanks for joining um yes i think coming up with a, a general out i mean that's what world building like that's what these books are you know they don't give you every detail they give you just a little bit you know um that's why i think for the desert area having the the peppers and the fruit that's more than enough don't even have to elaborate anymore you know having you know just not like i'll just show you something i've i have written um about my world so i i try to keep a consistent format i might change it um let me move all this paper all this paper um find a good example before i show it it's not done none of none of this stuff is done that's the thing i don't feel like it's good enough to really be shared or done yet um i got notes on like sticky notes too boom uh, I wrote an introduction. That's kind of cool. Um, it's like three-page introduction, too. Left some space for art. Uh, Orcs Arrow Peninsula. So um, originally I was thinking, oh, I'll do the Orcs Arrow Peninsula as its own supplement. Um, but anyway, so I have like a summary of the Orcs Arrow Peninsula here. For the amount of stuff, that's not much that's written. And... Uh, then I have a little bit more. So then for each city in the region, I write a little bit more and I write about uh, facts about the city population, which I might get rid of the population thing, make it more general. Uh, the ruler. Uh, I wrote clerics, rogues, wizards, and fighters, and I have a little blurb about each one because those are like the main four classes. Uh, important places. So like I wrote the temple, the market, and then a little bit about that, like a paragraph. Adventure hooks. So for the City of Ancients, which is that elven city I told you about, um, one of the adventure hooks is surface drow are coming. The surface drow, known as the Vela... I can't even say my own words. Vela Karam are raiding the City of Ancients on a more frequent basis. The city is struggling to fend them off and has been losing more and more guards. 
So it's kind of like a stealth mission type of thing that continues to happen. Other hook, this one could mess with people, but the City of Ancients doesn't exist. The search for the city is impossible. Not only does the forest change rapidly, but there are no signs of a city anywhere. There's a secret to finding the city, though. So I should probably reword that, too. There could be a secret to finding the city. Uh, no outsiders allowed is another hook. Anyone who discovers the city is hunted by the assassins of the City of Ancients. Due to wanting to stay isolated away from everyone, nobody will live to return to civilization. Uh, another thing I wrote was save the ruler's daughter. Someone has managed to capture the daughter of the ruler and is attempting to get her on a slave ship in Pirate's Bay. Rescue her before she is sold into slavery and be given a great reward by the ruler of the City of Ancients. Um... You know, again, I did the same thing for the Eastern Dwarven Territory. Uh, I only have two adventure hooks there for now. Uh, same thing for Western Dwarven Territory. You can see I haven't finished it, but I got that. Because um, I have a template that, that keeps the format, and then I just I erase, like, for example, under Clerics right now, this page says Story, because I haven't put, like, Paragraph. Um <laughs> Nobody can find the city unless they've been there before. <laughs> right, there you go. Um, Savage Mountains, Orcs Arrow Peninsula. So I got all sorts of things in here. Dragon Blade, which is one of the Orcish cities. Dragon Foot, Dragon Snout. Again, that's the three. Dragon Tooth. Um, that's the different dragon cities um, that the Orcs live in. Pirate's Cove. And then, boom. And then I separate it to go to the next portion, which... Next portion is that Pine Run area, which has like Brower Hans, um, you know, and stuff like that. So I've wrote quite a bit. I think the format works. It's it's not too much, but it's not too little. I like that a lot. I don't know. What do you guys think of that? Uh, I know you're into blood magic, but what do you think about rune magic? I think it's cool. I think magic in general is awesome. I like high fantasy. Uh, I like high magic. I thought society was moving towards paperless about 20 years ago. I love paper. <laughs> I don't like PDFs much. I, I'll check PDFs out. It's hard for me to really read them. Uh, for example, I'm trying to do a couple reviews, but I only have PDF copies of things. So I had shown at the beginning the uh, Under the Tavern PDF that I had printed. Um, so I can read that, obviously, because it's a physical copy, and then I do it. Same thing with like my... Other, like I have a couple other books that I've bought as PDFs and it's like I ended up printing them and binding them and it's like that costs just as much as if I would have bought the physical copy of the book. So it's just kind of dumb. But um, I've got some ab tab books on PDF that um, I'm going to be reviewing. Um, you know, so I just, I only have PDFs. I need the physical copies. And I print those. I mean, I got a full binder of ab tab, which I showed the other day. Um. Where did I leave off? Uh, I personally think rune magic has good possibilities. Me too. Um, I think if you're going to do rune magic, you got to, again, you got to make it something that not everyone can read. Um, and, you know, go from there. Poofed. Who needs trees anyways? Right? I agree. <laughs> Boatmen need trees for boats. <laughs> uh, numbing disaster. Send them a week. Send them a week to the dwarves can make boats out of iron in no time. Yes, I love it. <laughs> iron boats. Uh, Paul says, no one can find the city unless they have been there before. I like that. Uh, Numbing disaster. One thing I love about dwarves. Rule depicts. Everyone in the city has the same last name. Pretty much. Uh, I was thinking, <coughs> thinking they don't have last names. Numbing disaster. They're pretty much Nords who just thought, fuck going into the water. We'll chill in the mountain and never go outside. <laughs> Paul said, and everyone has unibrows in the city. It's in fashion. Jeez. Oh, man. I love it. Yeah, I... Uh, I no, I, I, there's a lot of things. I, I kind of like my format that I, I've come up with for what I write. It's easy to understand, easy to find what you want. Um, so I like that about it for sure. Um, I feel like though it makes my writing more generic and not as 
not as detailed sometimes as I want to be. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, I don't think it's a huge deal, but um, yeah, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, one of the things I want to do though, when I do this, cause again, I'd, I'd like to release these as supplements. I want to make it like a, a pay what you want and maybe a print on demand eventually. I think I've mentioned that before. Um, or even maybe even charging like a, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to figure out how big it is when I'm done and how qual like the quality of it, um, and artwork and stuff like that. So it's a version without any artwork and that's a pay what you want, but then based on the money I make off of that, if probably none, I put it back into artwork and then make a print on demand version. I don't know. Uh, probably getting too far ahead of myself thinking that way honestly uh, what about a village of werewolves like a ninja village uh, i have that so up near bog sylvania it's a again i love walden cities kind of forces your players to stay in a city um this is, is completely stolen from a game i played in uh ran by a guy uh when i lived in grand rapids and uh the idea was they had a harvest every whatever every year or something and in it people it was like an honor to be chosen for the harvest. Often some people became guards for the city. And other people were never seen again. Well, they went and basically turned them all into werewolves. You could go off, because in this Walden city, again, I love Walden cities, um, there's a ton, about 25% of it is actually the city. There's a mansion for where the mayor lives that's up on the hill. And then past it, if you go down the road, there's old ruins of an old castle and stuff like that. And that's where the werewolves live. Ones that are uncontrollable. The controllable ones become guards and protect against the werewolves. Um, so a lot of that was stolen from this game that I played in. Uh, as a player, I was like, oh, I love this idea. All the way down to the name Bog Sylvania. But yeah, so I, I've taken that idea, I've changed some things. There, like in it, there was like a willow, a bunch of willow wisps, uh, magical lanterns along the path to the ruins that could not come onto the path um, because of this blue light, you know, things like that. So that was cool. Um, like a ninja village but werewolves same last name and unibrows because they're all the same family because you can't find the place unless you're from there ninja werebears are cooler can make the village a secret cult thing every time you say that i hear walden not walled in <laughs> walden city better just call the city walden uh, maybe I will. I'm going to write it down. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I should probably go to bed just because because it's not that funny. Uh, will depicts. That is like, sorry, numbing disaster at Will depicts. That is like a horror movie setup. <laughs> oh, man. You guys are crazy. Oh. So yeah, I, I think we made some progress. Maybe I'll do another one of these tomorrow, depending on how tired I am, which I'm going to be exhausted. Maybe I'll do one during the day when the kids are up and you can see all the chaos going on. And I'll just do it just like this, and I'll just let the kids play in the other room right there. Whatever they feel like doing, come in every five minutes. But I'm sure I'll come up with some good ideas. And what I mean by that is you guys will come up with some good ideas and I'll just steal them. How it works. <laughs> I, ho I hope you guys enjoy this obviously i mean we have what five viewers so some people enjoy this it's two in the morning here eastern time somebody has to enjoy talking about this. six viewers now someone has to enjoy us talking about it um some of this so what i was saying though before is uh <laughs> uh what i was saying before is um my i want to organize it so it's like um I have a section that's strictly about the places and like stuff of you know more specifics, but then like a section that's like a monster, a short monster manual section, 
uh, a short faction setting or faction section. Um, and then maybe even a section about like special foods, items, and then even alchemy, uh, I think would be cool. So I have like all these different sections. Now, like the sections about monsters, it's not going to be stat blocks whatsoever. In fact, it might completely leave out stat blocks. It, but it'll have stuff like, say, the giant centipede, for example. Uh, giant centipede found in this portion of the world. Um, they're very rare, and I won't be specific, but either rare or common or whatever. And uh, what they eat, what they're known for, maybe even what they're used for, both as domesticated or if they're killed, like what you know, what kind of armor is made or whatever. I think that would be kind of cool. Um. <laughs> uh, enjoying it mightily. Thanks for the discussion. Hey, thank you, Logos. I appreciate it. Uh, Will depicts, I dare you to make a 15-minute vid with your kids awake where poop isn't a subject. My son is two and a half. He'll be three in March. And he's potty training. It is perfectly normal for poop to be talked about daily, all day. Paul says, I am sane. I just narrate how characters die on a bi-weekly basis. That's sane, right? Paul, at will depicts. That would be a challenge indeed. It would. Uh, numbing disaster. I don't know why, but I've been a lot more into spiders and centipedes lately. So much as to looking into possible pets. Yeah, no. <laughs> numbing disaster. Those feeding videos will change your life. I hate bugs. I hate bugs. There, there's a couple things I hate in life. Uh, I am afraid of heights. And I, for the most part, I mean, I can pick up a spider and throw it out the door or whatever. I'm, I'm afraid of bugs. You know, just like the idea of, I mean, I, I have little fears, but the, my biggest fear is heights for sure. But yeah, bugs bother me. Um, centipedes are gross. Centipedes aren't into you, then you're okay. Uh, I, I love the idea of incorporating bugs into game worlds. Um, I think there's a lot of people with phobias of them. So if you use them in your world, you can do some stuff to actually give your players the heebie-jeebies. Um, I know people are afraid of snakes. Snakes don't bother me. Um, yes, yeah, in fact, snakes are just not scary at all to me whatsoever. But I'm in Michigan, so I, I think we only have like one very rare poisonous snake in Michigan that it runs from people anyway, so it's not even like you really have a chance to get bit by it. Uh, my only fear is a massive injury of death of my children, nothing else comes close. Yeah, you know, I never thought that I'd be like that, but yeah, I have, I'm extremely protective of my kids, like constantly telling my kids, be careful, don't do that, you might fall, you might get hurt, like I'm instilling fear in them, that, like my son is fearless, he jumps off of beds and all sorts of stuff, and all I can think about is he's going to fall and break his head, break his head open. <laughs> I saw that video about the raining spiders, and I thought about a possible spider enemy where they breed by shooting their offspring into the air and have the babies feast on those they fall on. Dude, that's sick. I love it. I did something uh, like that video. Um, I did something with a mimic. Well, actually, it started, it's a necromancer. Uh, it's called The Mystery of the Black Hand. He was, he was casting silence on houses at night. like in the, So a whole house would fall under the radius of silence. And he was going in, well, well cutting their hands off in this silence so they couldn't scream for help and bleeding them out and then turning them into zombies to walk back and keeping the hands. And uh, he was always leaving a black handprint on the door of his victims. And uh, he had mimics in his lair that he stored all the hands in and they were those monsters that are hands. One of the players in the game went up to open a chest and the mimic opened its mouth and shot out like, 30 hands that started attacking the players. It was it was a fun scene. I loved it. And they were like, oh my gosh. I just took a bunch of tiny D6s that I have and just was like, here you go. <laughs> Threw them on the map. 
Got to hand it to that guy. <laughs> yep. Uh, I saw that video. I saw it. I read that already. Helicopter parenting. <laughs> Got to hand it to that guy. Yeah, no, I, so I, I love that stuff. I love playing with imagery from things I see in day-to-day -day life. You know, that, that spider vi uh, video. Great example. Great example. Hand grenade. <laughs> I was a super active when I was a child. If you lost sight of me for one moment and I would be on top of a fridge. Sears was always a fun trip like that. I'll wake up and if he's awake before me, he will be on the counter. Um, he gets into some crazy stuff. It's like, how do you get, how'd you get up there? Fearless man. Two and a half years old. Fearless kid. He's fallen countless times. He's fallen downstairs. He's my daughter gets it like pain scares her pain does not scare my son whatsoever he's just like oh okay like he tests his boundaries all the time all the time hiding in the clothing racks yeah i used to do that my mom used to go to fashion bug or something like that and i used to hide in the middle of the clothes i used to watch tv at sears i used to sit on the washing machine my dad was a salesman or my dad my grandpa was a salesman uh, in the appliances section. And so I used to sit there and watch TV across the way. So that was kind of cool. Because so I used to go to church with him on Sundays. And afterwards, we'd go to his work for a couple hours and I'd either walk through the mall or hang out right there at Sears and watch football. Uh, in one world that I have, I have a section of the map that is literally sea of teeth scenario. Every water beast you can imagine is there, along with nonstop monsoons and choppy waters. Uh, I like that. Uh, that was one of the ideas. So I, I had said earlier that I have like this idea for like a Mount Olympus with these immortals on it that can't leave the island. And, um, you know, there you can go there and get weapons, like really powerful weapons. However, to get there, you have to go through the Kraken, giant dragon turtles, like you just awful things, hurricanes, terrible, terrible things that are near impossible to get through. And it would be a long trip to get there. So I like that idea, definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I never did that. I wasn't super uh, hyper as a kid. But yeah, it's crazy. Uh, there's a race of aquatic goblins that make large city boats in the shape of near island-sized turtles that are near impossible to kill and have perfect body structure. Predators stay clear. And no environment damage. Interesting. Interesting. So, all right, it's it's after two. Uh, I'm going to go to bed. Hopefully, I can do another video t tomorrow like this. Um, it, probably not. I'll probably be too tired, but we'll see. Um, but maybe Saturday. So I want to write down some of this stuff that I came up with. So maybe I'll watch this tomorrow or listen back to it and make some notes. Um, I want to get my Anvil Ringers written out and uh, get that going. But... Hey, no, thank you guys. Um, you guys sleep well. I enjoyed this. Uh, hope, again, hopefully you guys did too. I, I, you know, Maybe we can get some more people and some more ideas going in the future. But uh, yeah, thank you again. I appreciate it. Uh, go check out DMG Infos um, if you're just watching this. Out under the tavern. Um, go check out the guys at AbTab. I had talked about some of their stuff tonight. Be a better Weapon Master 2. Uh, I've skimmed the PDF. It's good. Uh, I like it. I liked the first one. So go check that out as well. Those are just my quick little plugs. And uh, go join my Master of the Game Facebook group if you haven't yet. So that's it. Love you guys. Peace.